The next section of the morning, uh, before we head into lunch and the panel discussion, really comes back, I think, to, to, to where we started this morning with respect to the social contract. Uh, the social contract, as described by Dr. Cruz, involves our relationship uh, with society. And I would say that in excess of 90% of the people in this room uh, are physicians. Uh, we've heard from physicians, and we thought that to end the morning, we should perhaps hear from from some individuals that represent non-physicians. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Stephen Alexander. Mr. Exa Alexander has got a bachelor's and master's degree in behavioral sciences and is a communications strategist. He has a, a company that's called the Steve Alexander Group, which facilitates, uh, does facilitation and strategic communication in public affairs. He uh, had a former gubernatorial appointee as a chair of a board in the California Department of Consumer Affairs and uh, of significant interest, and the reason that he's here today, uh, other than his, his obvious skills in other areas, is that he's the immediate past president of the Medical Board of California. So to provide some thoughts and insights on, uh, and a response to, to what's been discussed this morning so far from the medical regulatory regulators, regulators' perspective, I'd like to introduce Mr. Stephen Alexander. So uh, when I talked to Bill about coming today to do this, um, I said, what do I need to prepare in terms of notes? And he said, nothing, don't worry about it. Just come and sit and you know, give us your thoughts. And of course, I walked in and I saw that I was a speaker. Uh, <laughs> so that I'm sure many of you have felt that experience before. You know, okay, now what am I going to say? But of course, Bill, and, and I love him dearly, he's appeared before our board over the years that I've been on the board, uh, the medical board in California. And he was 100% right, because now I have somebody sat next to me and said, oh my god, I'm intimidated. Look at all the notes you're taking. You know? So I have lots of notes. Uh, about what I heard and what I thought I would start out with is just simply sharing with you my perspective and, and some reflection and feedback about some of the comments that you struggled with and for the person who raised their hand about the question could you moderate that debate that's what I do for a living so we'll talk afterwards <laughs> those are the things I love the airport authority for those of you who are from San Diego the San Diego Airport Authority is one of my clients you probably know they've had some controversies recently about whether to move the airport and, and that sort of thing. So that's the kind of stuff I do. And of course, Bill has seen in the work that I do as both president of the, of the medical board uh, as well as a, a member of the board is oftentimes we're mediating those, those conflicts you know, between the, the public will, the public good, so to speak, and the, and the practice of medicine. So I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights real quickly. The first observation, and again, this is coming from this, the, the three speakers. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say was, you know, you asked a question, you talked about we really need to build in feedback at a student level, and Rusty's in the back, and he had invited me out uh, to UCSD. And I sat before this group of students who were, I know, you know, worried, you know, they need to get on with their class lecture and stuff. And I don't think they'd ever seen anyone from the medical board before. And you know who we are? You know, if you have a license in this room in the state of California, either I or one of my colleagues signed that license, we regulate you. And though I don't have my badge on, our investigators wear badges and guns. They are the police. Basically, that's what we do. We regulate and enforce, just like when you leave here today, hopefully you won't run a stop sign. Uh, but if you did, and there was a cop nearby, that cop would stop you, they would cite you, and then you'd have to appear in court. Well, that's who we are, and that's what we do. So it's a pretty serious charge, and yet at the same time, I think if students at a student level can't sort of get that piece, they miss a real big part of their education. Because it's not about just getting educated, building a practice and getting a license. I, I'm licensed as a family therapist. I don't practice anymore. So I know that whole regulatory schema and, and what you're thinking about when you're a student. If they don't get it at that early process, then they usually don't miss it. Uh, they miss it completely. They usually don't, don't ever get it until they hear from us, either in the form of 
a letter, a citation, or something of that nature, or someone who comes to their office literally with a badge and a gun, and that does happen and happens uh, uh, often. So I think that's really important when that was first raised this morning and talked about, you really need to build this in at a, at a student level. Uh, the, the, the second is they have to be able to translate, and I heard this today and I couldn't agree with it more, that, it, that, that what they learn in terms of professionalism matters to their career. They don't want to be before us for those reasons. They'd rather be appointed like I was by the governor, serve on one of our committees or appear before us like Bill does, do work in the PACE program, that sort of thing. They, they don't really want to you know, ha have an experience with us that's a disciplinary one. So I think they need to understand as well not only getting at an earlier level, but that professionalism translates into something that makes them credible. And, and I love the, the first speaker when you talked about how it's society that really dictates what that is. And you pose that question you know, from, from your perspective in Ireland. It really is society. You're a part of that, and you, and you shape that. But it is society as, as a whole. Uh, one, one other uh, comment that was made, and, and I use this all the time because, again, I do a lot of mediation work and a lot of work with large groups of people where there is disparate opinion. You know, should it be this way or should it be that way? And so one comment I'd make, and I'd make an observation, and this is my sort of lecturing at you a little bit, is when you talk about feedback, I use, always use this analogy with people. How many of you here fly planes? I mean, you're a pilot, right? You fly a plane, okay? Anybody ever fly on automatic pilot? Okay. Automatic pilot, you know, is giving you every millisecond feedback, right? Without an automatic pilot giving you feedback, ultimately, you know, if you're eating your sandwich and not paying attention, you crash. So an automatic pilot is a feedback mechanism. Now, when you're on automatic pilot, it doesn't ask, I'm going to give you some good feedback now, right? Would you like good feedback or would you, are you okay with some bad feedback? The automatic pilot just gives feedback. So I would love if I could, after today, get you to stop using the word good and bad, positive and negative, because feedback is neither of those two things. And I've been doing this kind of work for decades. If you can help folks to understand that feedback is what keeps you from crashing, right? The FAA uses a model that I'll talk about in, in just a minute, a model that uh, it, I've been trying to provoke our board to look at as a great experiment in regulation, and that is that when a plane crashes, everyone immediately cooperates. No one looks for attorneys, right? No one looks toward litigation. They all look toward cooperation. How can we learn from this and gain feedback? Right, so that we can improve what we're doing. So if I could, I would urge you to get rid of those words and instead look at it from this concept in terms of dealing with professionalism. What are we doing that's working and what do we need to improve? And that ca captures a whole, that concept you talk about defensiveness, you know, people get defensive, uh oh, you're gonna give me feedback, I'm defensive. Please help me to learn what I'm doing well and what I can improve. And that characterizes it in a much different way. So it's one of the other thoughts that uh, uh, you touched upon this morning. Uh, the third is, you know, as uh, again, you talked about professionalism. T uh, s someone said it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I sit as a panelist. I, I have to know enough about medicine to understand these cases because we see reams of cases. You know, we're the folks who send the folks to bill or not. We typically don't send them to jail. The, the other courts do that, the criminal courts do that, but we do revoke their licenses or discipline them in, in various levels. And we do believe that from a regulatory perspective. You cannot separate, as the case we've seen, the guy who is angry at someone and comes out of the Home Depot parking lot and completely keys that car, right? Scratches the paint all the way around the car. An MD who got angry at somebody because they cut them off or whatever the case may be. We see those cases because we believe it is as you said, it's seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, that you are professional or you fail at that in, in some form. So I, think, I thought that was another important piece. And the last thought I wanted to leave you with, we'll take a couple of questions, is uh, the vision that I talked about. I've served on the medical board for, I think, about five years or, or so. I'm the immediate past president. I've got a couple more years. I've gone through two different governors and previously served as the chairman of the, another regulatory board, the Behavioral Sciences Board, which is the other clinical specialty, social work and family therapy and such. I have a vision for our board, and I'm going to continue to drive toward this, that we move out of the disciplinary business, ultimately, and that we move into the FAA model. And last year, as president, I appointed uh, Dr. Cesar Aristigueta, uh, who's the head of the whole EMS system in California, to really look at this. If, if any, of, any of you here heard of Sorry Works, organization Sorry Works? That's a really powerful organization that's trying to take the approach that uh, when there's an error or a problem or a professionalism breach, that you really look at how to deal with the patient care, 
as you've talked about, and that you try to look at ways to ameliorate that, learn from that, and become more professional and instill that professionalism in the rest of the uh, profession, uh, the, the rest of the practice of medicine. So we're looking now at can that model work for us where maybe 10% of our cases are those real harsh disciplinary cases where someone's literally someone's murdered someone and they've gone to jail for that and obviously they can't hold their license to practice medicine. They're serving jail time. Pretty serious kind of cases of that nature. May constitute a very small portion, but the rest of what the board might do and might look at, especially in light of the kinds of things I hear today, is how could we instead institute a program where folks would be uh, put into a system where instead of being disciplined, they're really look, looking at, like the PACE program or otherwise, which does have to do with, a, it's a disciplinary model, but really looks at it from the perspective of how do we instill more professionalism? How do we pick up that gap that was somehow lost <coughs> along the way? And how others can then learn from that on a case study basis, rather than it be something that all of you look at when you get your quarterly newsletter from us, right? And look in the back to see that name there. Isn't that a shame, right? that instead we wouldn't be looking at the case studies of saying, here, like with the FAA, we learned pilot error contributed to this, or patient misinformation contributed to this, or a system setting contributed to this. So that's, that's my vision. I wanted to share that with you. It's something I'll continue to work on as long as I'm on the board, because I think it does reach that collaboration between society, the profession, and we uh, as regulators. So with that, I'll take a couple of comments or questions if you'd like. Or so I'll be around. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another part of society is organized medicine, and so we thought that we should get a response on, on, on the discussion this morning from a representative from organized medicine. And so um, we've asked Ms. Jill Silverman, who uh, is currently the president and CEO of the Institute for Medical Quality in San Francisco, to share her thoughts on the morning. Um, Ms. Silverman has a BA in politics from Princeton University and a Master's of Science in Health Policy and Management from Harvard University. Um, uh, her career highlights include, uh, including what she's doing now, she has been previously the director of the California Medical Association's Division of Medical Practice and Quality Improvement and is the exec has been the executive vice president of the Des Dental Risk Foundation and she is going to share her thoughts with us uh, about her uh, response to this morning's session from the perspective of organized medicine. Thanks. I should have talked with Steve beforehand. It sounds like we were having parallel conversations with Bill Norcross about why do you want me up here and what should I do. It's a very intimidating group to, to be in front of, but I really appreciate this opportunity. I've, I've enjoyed this morning. I've learned a tremendous amount, and I think there's an opportunity to maybe share some information back. I'm curious, how many in this room um, are from academic institutions? Okay, that sort of the sense I got. Um, we, um, well, I think that one of the things that's been missing from this morning's discussion about professionalism is there's a lot of focus about teaching, educating, um, preparing physicians for professionalism, but then there's this big hole about what happens once they leave their residency, once they go out into the community. Some of them stay in the academic institution, so you've got some connection with them. But for the community physicians, what's going on there? And I think that's a place where we step forward and where I see huge untapped opportunities for a lot more interaction, a lot more feeding back and forth from each other. Um, if I can back up for a second, um, uh, I, IMQ, as we refer to the Institute for Medical Quality, is a subsidiary of CMA. Uh, and by way of my background, I've spent seven years as a director of policy for CMA, so I understand the advocacy side of it. Um, about 12 years ago, CMA looked at it and said, you know, there's a whole world of quality of care and we're kind of schizophrenic here. We're an advocacy organization, but we also want to be professionals, and we want to promote quality, and we want to make sure that physicians are practicing good care. And sometimes the politics and the infrastructure that goes along with that get in the way of effectively implementing these programs. So in its, I think, great wisdom, the CMA decided to spin off a subsidiary. We formed a uh, separate board of directors, which by design does not overlap with the board of directors of the CMA um, and is a phenomenal group, primarily physicians, a couple of non-physicians who are totally devoted to figuring out ways to make the quality of care better. A lot of our activities are in the accreditation and certification arena. Uh, for the, How many of you are in California? 
Okay, so more than half of you are not, so are probably not at all familiar. But in California, we participated in the survey of acute care hospitals with the Joint Commission and with the California Department of Public Health. It's a joint accreditation and licensure survey. We, uh, uh, like most states, we provide the, we accredit the CME providers within the state. We also voluntarily accredit the health care within the correctional institutions in the, in the state, the jails and juvenile halls, or um, juvenile uh, detention, juvenile facilities, excuse me. And we have a program where we accredit ambulatory facilities, surgery centers, um, and medical offices. The, all of our accreditation programs, the participation in that program is done by actively practicing physicians from the community who basically volunteer their time. They see this as their commitment or one of their commitments to professionalism to give, go back and participate and go out into the community, review the care that is going on uh, and try to help their colleagues improve what they're doing and meet the standards. Most of them will tell you the real reason they come into the program is that they learn an awful lot by seeing what everybody else is doing and it helps them do what they need to do a little bit better. But what it goes back to is the old concept, and I guess I have that nostalgia in me too, but I grew up with a, you know, my dad finished med school in the 40s, so we also grew up with people bringing carvings to the house to pay for care. He was an internist and, and the mechanic would come and do the, repair our car and I don't know, you know, how things were ever paid, but it was just, that was the norm. It wasn't, he wasn't any more unique than anybody else in the community. And peer review was critical. A lot of things have changed in the environment in this country. A lot of care was centered around the hospital. Now fewer and fewer pra physicians are actually practicing in the hospital. Hospitals have taken over. Um, for the physicians that are still there, the hospital has some oversight, but a lot of physicians in our community rarely step foot into a hospital anymore. In the, quote, old days, there were community, uh, the local medical association. Every physician coming out joined the local medical association. It was a place to network. It was a place to share information. It was a place to, you know, get referrals, make referrals, whatever. It was a focus of the social world. I remember as a kid growing up, and I, I went to a public high school, but I came home one day and I was so excited because I had a friend and her dad was not a doctor. And it was a really exciting thing for me because I thought everyone's dad was a doctor because that's, that was the entire social world was the rest of the medical community. That doesn't exist anymore. It's a whole different world. And I, what we are seeing, and I think a lot of you were, will, is as physicians go out into the community, if they go into a big system, the physicians that join Permanente, they have a system and a networking uh, there for them. A lot of the other systems have that. But there are other physicians in the community that have lost that network. And to do peer review, peer review doesn't happen very well or at all in some of these situations. There isn't the ongoing education unless it is a directed education and an intentional focused activity. And I think that when you talk about professionalism, you talk about looking back to the next generation or, or looking forward, it has to, we have to find a way, all of us together, to integrate it a little better and find a continuity of education from uh, the medical student through the residency and out into the community that keeps going back and forth. Uh, we struggle with this issue. I admit very honestly that the majority of our surveyors, uh, we joke that when we have a surveyor that's 65, we got a youngster and we're very thrilled about it. Um, that doesn't bode well for our future. Um, not that, you know, they're, they're wonderful, but we, we struggle as well to bring the next generation in. Uh, we have, we do a lot of educational programs. We do peer review um, where we actually send physicians out to medical staffs, to medical groups by request in a non, this is not when they're preparing for a lawsuit, it's not when they're trying to get rid of somebody, but when they identify that, gee, you know, we're not sure if the care is what it should be, and we don't think we have enough, uh, anyone here that doesn't have a conflict of interest in this case, either real or perceived, to evaluate whether what is going on is right. Can you help us out? And we can send in a couple of physicians to review cases, to meet with the physician involved, to meet with whoever is relevant to the case, and try to make constructive recommendations about how they could be better educated, if there is in fact a problem, if, there's, if there are 
things in the environment of care and the systems there that are impacting the outcomes that are not related to the physician's clinical competence, if there are personality issues and so forth. These are all, I think, a part of maintaining professionalism and I hope as we go forward in the discussions and the plans of where we can go that um, there will be some discussion that goes beyond the training and the education, which is critical, absolutely critical, but the maintenance and into the community and uh, improving uh, that ability to work together and, and collaborate on these problems. And thank you very much.